Hey guys, Drifter here. Today, I want to talk about why I think Black Ops 3 is the best game in the Call of Duty franchise. I got the idea because I just watched the reveal for Call of Duty Black Ops 6, which is so far looking quite good. However, seeing the number 6 in a Call of Duty game, especially a sub-franchise that doesn't even come out every year, got me thinking about how long I've been playing this franchise. And as it turns out, I've played every single Call of Duty game over the last 20 years, and I started thinking about among the last 20, which one was the absolute best? Which one did I enjoy? Which one did I think had the overall best quality? I know that most people would probably say that Modern Warfare 2 is the best Call of Duty game ever made, and maybe an barely smaller group would say Black Ops 2. There's a bunch of fans of Warzone 1, which was great, and a surprising number of Call of Duty Ghost stands out there. But for me, I think there's only one Call of Duty game that stands at the absolute pinnacle of what COD should be, and that game is Black Ops 3. So today, I'm going to take some time to explain why I think Call of Duty Black Ops 3 is the best that the franchise has ever been. It's going to be a mostly multiplayer focused video, but I will be talking about campaign and zombies as well in the latter half of the video. And the short version of this is that I think Treyarch took the design philosophies that made Black Ops 2 so good and perfected them in Black Ops 3. And the perfect analogy to another game is I think Halo 3 is superior to Halo 2. Even though Halo 2 is wildly more innovative and ahead of its time, Halo 3 is just those ideas perfected. So let's start off this Black Ops 3 discussion with the most important thing in any Call of Duty game, which is the weapons. Weapon design in Black Ops 3 and balance were some of the absolute best that I've ever seen in any Call of Duty game. Every single weapon in the game, balance-wise, had a distinct niche in which it excelled. A certain map, a certain scenario, a certain play style. It had, there was a weapon that would fit that. And beyond that, every weapon was usable in most situations. There were very few outliers of weapons that were extremely strong or extremely weak and could not be used. Most of the guns in the game were very general, they were very fun, you could use them on most of the maps. And of the available optics in the game, the vast majority of them were very clear and easy to use. So when I was aiming down sights, I could always tell what was going on. The same was true of the iron sights. The majority of the weapons had very clear, easy to use iron sights, so that was all always an available option, thank goodness. The recoil in Black Ops 3 was highly predictive instead of random. Some Call of Duty games lean very heavily on random recoil or recoil within certain bounds. Now, Black Ops 3 definitely did have this system. It had a randomness to it, but not a lot. Not as much as previous Call of Duty games and not as much as a variety of Call of Duty games that came afterwards. The recoil was mostly predictive, meaning that it was masterable, meaning that once you got a feel for the gun, you would know how it would perform in every Every scenario and with every set of attachments, which was great because every weapon design-wise had a unique feel and personality to it. Each gun had its own character, so to speak, and everything about them made sense from the sound effects the weapons had to the design, to the colors, the animations, the gas ejections, almost everything about them just felt right. It felt sane. It felt normal. It made sense to me. And I feel like Treyarch hit the absolute perfect balance of weapons that are futuristic, but still somewhat recognizable. I think the guns in this game were definitely unrealistic, and they were in a sense cartoony, but they were cartoony in a way that still appealed to me. It made sense within the lore and within the aesthetics of the game that I was playing. Kind of like you would say, Warframe isn't a hyper-realistic game by any means, but most of the things in it make sense inside of its own aesthetic. So for me, the Black Ops 3 guns felt very cool instead of silly. I think weapon cosmetics were top-notch for this time. There's a lot of tiny customizations to guns, special versions you could unlock. The camos were great. On the topic of camos, I still think the Dark Matter camo is one of the best looking camos in Call of Duty history, especially given how old that camo is and how well it is held up to modern times. And most of the weapons in the game were still hit scans. Thank goodness this was before Treyarch and Infinity Ward and everybody else moved off to uh, projectile based weapons for Battle Royale. So they were all hit scans, which for the mostly close quarters combat nature of the game made perfect sense. There were a few anomalous weapons, especially in DLC that would come that were projectiles of some sort, but those are most like sci-fi spacey future kind of weapons. And we'll actually be uh, revisiting this topic of how you unlocked weapons in a section near the end 
and about flaws because no game is perfect. Next up, I wanted to talk about movement and then about the combat loop of the game. I know that most Call of Duty gamers do not like advanced movement games, and to be honest with you, most gamers in general seem to struggle with 3D movement FPSs. If you look back at the last several 3D movement FPS releases, off the top of my head, the finals is the most recent one, there's a lot of gamers that just don't really like that. They do seem to enjoy boots on the ground combat more, so I understand that 3D movement is not everybody's niche, and I can respect that. However, it most certainly is my niche, and I absolutely love 3D movement games. So when it comes to 3D movement or advanced movement in Call of Duty games, I think Black Ops 3 did it better than any other COD game. For comparison, Advanced Warfare was first up, so they had a lot to uh, sort of figure out. Those was mostly boost jumps and boost slides. It was very linear, very jerky. You could fling yourself really fast in one direction, and then you would kind of have to stop. Infinite Warfare, which came after Black Ops 3, felt clunkier than Black Ops 3 in my opinion, and kind of sadly copied the system from Black Ops 3. It didn't really innovate or do anything new, I guess they didn't want to fix something that wasn't broken, but I think Black Ops 3 had this beautiful balance of abilities. You had a limited amount of wall running time, and the ability to jump, boost, or change your direction in mid-air, However, it came with a little meter that counted down right underneath your crosshairs that would let you know how much boost and juice you would have left before resetting so it would help you manage your momentum. I think this was the first Call of Duty game to ever have water combat, at least that I can recall. And no, the one mission in Call of Duty Ghost where you swim around underwater and deal with fish AI doesn't really count because it wasn't multiplayer. It was a novelty. It was a thing they put together really fast, like playing the dog in that game, which to be fair, was really fun. Uh, but Black Ops 3 had proper water combat for multiplayer, and all of this blended together really well. So you could, say, jump off of a balcony, change directions in midair to plant your feet on a wall, hit a wall run, jump off of that to dip out of a gunfight into the water, and then continue your gunfight either under the water, if the person you were fighting chased you under, or shoot up out of the water at them. All of this with guns up pretty much the entire time and very limited disruptions to your combat abilities. You were pretty much able to fight and move as much as you wanted in this game, and it was an unprecedented freedom of movement that Call of Duty had never seen before. Of course, on top of this, you had your standard sprinting, crouching, proning, mantling, knee sliding, or boost knee sliding in this game. And again, the incredible thing is that it all actually worked. It all meshed together really well. To me, it didn't feel janky. It didn't feel rushed or sloppy in any way. It felt very professional, smooth, and polished, much like the original Titanfall release and like Titanfall 2. And importantly, all of the maps in the game were designed with this mechanic in mind. Each map offered a variety of obvious with big labels and arrows, a few hidden and a few very advanced sort of secret 3D movement routes so that you could engage however you wanted. And it also greatly increased the skill ceiling of the game. This was the time when I was playing on the four paddle scuff and I was using all four paddles to do crazy stuff all the time. I absolutely loved it. So because of this, I feel that the combat loop in Black Ops 3 is actually very tight, which is a good thing. In the game, it's very easy to respawn, move fast, find a fight in an area that you want to be in, and there wasn't a lot of boring downtime restrictions or limitations on your abilities. The game probably had the most amount of gunfight of any Call of Duty game that I've ever played, and I think that's a great thing. Moving on to the next thing I love about Black Ops 3, let's talk about the maps. I think Black Ops 3 had some of the most beautiful and best designed maps in Call of Duty history. Almost every single map was a true work of art in terms of aesthetics. It, it just They all fit in so well within the game, and Treyarch absolutely nailed the coloring of the maps. Call of Duty games are kind of notorious for being Fifty Shades of Brown, Gray, Sand, Dust, Depressing, Bleached Colors, Washed, Hard to See Enemies. You've probably heard that mostly of Infinity Ward games. And Black Ops 2 was a huge departure and improvement from this, so was Black Ops 1, honestly. But I feel like Black Ops 3 did it best. They went the exact opposite route of most Call of Duty games and had bright, vibrant, profoundly colorful and interesting maps. Not only was this much more pleasant to look at, to see the actual color green and blue and even sometimes purple, 
but it also made identifying enemies much easier because they didn't blend into the environment very well. After the game had completed its DLC cycle, I would say that Black Ops 3 probably had the most diverse set of maps in any Call of Duty game. Off the top of my head, we had a map that was a water park, a couple of destroyed cities, jungles, a futuristic nuketown with robots, the California Redwoods, there was a map that was just the floor is lava, snow maps, cryogenic facilities, skyscrapers, haunted castles, maps in a futuristic city where you could hijack mechs and do mech battles, and then my personal favorite was Micro, a map where you and all the other players are shrunk down to about one inch tall and you have to fight each other on a picnic table with giant ants and you're taking cover behind soda cans and wall running off of cheese and crazy stuff like that. On top of all of this variety, most of these maps also played very well. As I mentioned before, most of them were designed with advanced movement and wall running in mind. So the vast majority of the maps had a dozen different ways to navigate any choke point, any obstacle, or any type of engagement. There were obvious wall run paths, there were secret ones, there were really advanced ones that maybe the developers didn't want you to do, but they did find it very fun and allowed to stay in the game. There were so many unique ways to engage with people and fight with people, I thought it was just brilliant. And that's why when I did my review of the best Treyarch maps in Call of Duty history, a disproportional amount of them were from Black Ops 3, because Black Ops 3 had the best maps for their combat system, which was advanced movement. They were colorful, they were beautiful, they were fun, they were funny, they were wild. It was all the things that I would want in a Call of Duty game. I think Black Ops 3 had some of the best character designs in the entire series, and that was absolutely necessary because it was the first Call of Duty game to have hero shooter abilities. They took cues from Destiny and Overwatch and also took cues from their developers to design the characters to have very unique silhouettes. That way, no matter what lighting level or what distance you were from looking at an enemy character, no matter what skins they were, their overall body shape was distinct and would let you know what their moveset was likely to be. That means when you see a person approaching in a distance, maybe if you can't tell specifically what skin they are, you can see the outline of the character and you know, okay, that's Ruin. Ruin might have a big Ruin slam to throw down, so I need to watch out for that guy and keep my distance. That's what they tried to do, and in my opinion, they succeeded. I think the character design team did a fantastic job of this, and it worked exactly the way they wanted it to. It was very easy to tell who you were fighting against and what their moveset was likely to be. Beyond that, the characters themselves were unique and fun to play as. All of the multiplayer characters or heroes had a unique backstory that would be unveiled through multiplayer voice lines, and that backstory would ultimately elevate the character and the use of their abilities. For example, Seraph is a Singaporean triad enforcer who lost her arm and was given a cybernetic, much stronger arm, so she's the only person that can handle the hand cannon, the annihilator that one-shots people. Reaper was a rogue AI that stole a military combat body and has a powerful minigun weapon because he is designed to very literally be an agent of death. Or Prophet is one of the very few characters to know that he's stuck in a simulation and actually managed to hack the simulation to go back in time like Tracer and alter various things on the map. And, and I didn't just bury the lead there, the multiplayer also had its own plot such that all of the characters were copies of other people's brains, fully conscious, not entirely aware that they're stuck in a simulation. And you as the multiplayer gamer are playing through these AI avatars of people and they're stuck fighting each other over and over and over again for all eternity. There's even a character, the assassin one, that was responsible for putting them into the simulation. It was such a neat fact to add to multiplayer, just a little cherry on top that if you pay attention and listen to their voice lines, you'll realize that they're all sort of AI remnants of regular people that are stuck trying to figure out why they're constantly fighting each other. I also think that the hero abilities were not bad or annoying. Okay, well, there were a few that were a little bit annoying, but honestly, they were much better designed than most of the contemporary games hero shooter abilities, and better designed than most of the games that came after Black Ops 3. They were exemplary for their time, and most of them were quite fun. I personally enjoyed playing Prophet so that I could glitch back in time and just teleport backwards. I enjoyed playing the Assassin character so much. I think it's clipped by the camera, but I have the uh, the Ripper, the blade thing behind me. It's up directly above my head, perfectly cut off. I have like a life-size replica that glows. It was like getting old Commando Pro kills. I loved Ruin Slamming. I loved doing a lot of things with the character abilities. Bow and Arrow was very, very fun too. 
And the tactical abilities were the ones that had a tendency to get more annoying, such as invisibility, the giant flashbang on firebreak, extra armor, but ultimately most people gravitated toward the weapons, and even these tactical abilities did have some degree of counterplay, so I didn't get frustrated by them very often. On the topic of counterplay and things that are frustrating, I think that one of the weaker parts of Black Ops 3 is that the score streaks in the game actually weren't very innovative. Most of them were just reskins from Black Ops 2. For example, the wraps or the big spiky balls that would chase you around and blow up are literally just dogs from Black Ops 2 and 1 reskinned. There's a Hover RCXD <laughs> instead of a regular one. The Hellfire missile or cluster missile is identical to what it was in Black Ops 2, just reskinned a little bit. Uh, the big automated robot isn't that different than the one that you had in Black Ops as well. And again, not super innovative, not very creative, but also very serviceable. And importantly, most of these had really good counterplay. There were ways to avoid certain streaks. There were ways to hide from them, either detection or line of sight. Uh, you could shoot most of them, even with your big character abilities, like you could break out Seraph's Annihilator and just drop score streaks around the map, same with Prophet's Gun. So there were a lot of ways to drop the score streaks, including the little black hat tacticals that would let you take over or disable devices, and probably the coolest score streak in the game. And one of the coolest ones I've seen in Call of Duty in a very long time was the Mothership, this giant behemoth of a, of, a, of a leviathan of a ship that would come onto the map and your teammates could jump on the guns of the ship and continue to rain down fire on the map along with you. I don't think there's ever been a score streak quite as devastating or as fun as the mothership and even that one had counterplay. It was not insanely hard to shoot down even if it was powerful. So on top of all of these specific reasons of why I think Black Ops 3 multiplayer was so good, I'd like to reiterate that one of the reasons that it's good is that all of these pieces fit together really well. The overall package was very smooth, very visually appealing, very unique. Uh, they got, uh, you know, they reinvented some things but left things that weren't broke unfixed. You know, the, <laughs> the guns felt right for the movement, the streaks felt right for the maps, the maps felt right for the gunfights, the HUD, uh, the sights, the UI, the elements, everything, even the character silhouettes, it all meshed together into a whole cohesive, complete package, and it was very easy to tell what was going on at any given time. I also enjoyed that the skill ceiling for advanced movement was fairly high, but not unapproachably so. It wasn't painfully so. And I just really liked this game. It's the only Call of Duty game that I have ever bothered to go for the maximum camo on. In my 20 years of playing Call of Duty, I was never motivated to get the whatever highest level camo is, or prestige, or do anything like that. And I've done in-depth for 10, 15 years, so much testing, so much gameplay, so many events, and I never really cared for gold, diamond, interstellar, but man, I grinded Black Ops 3 Dark Matter. It was really fun. I was really motivated to play, and that says a lot about the game. Lastly, before I wrap up the good section, I wanted to mention campaign and zombies. Briefly, campaign was short and sweet, but I did enjoy it. It's not well remembered because it's a little bit short, and it's also the most trippy, high concept, and unusual Call of Duty campaign out there because it's simulations and simulations and what is real, and the entire campaign campaign is much more like a precursor to a Black Mirror episode, which is even more relevant today. And I think the campaign had a cool bonus level because after you beat the main campaign, it unlocks a bonus ending like an Avengers in-game post-credit scenario called, I believe it was called Nightmares. And I can't even talk about what happens in Nightmares because that would spoil the ending of the rest of the campaign, but it adds this massive twist at the end that just gives you a whole new level of understanding about what you just played through. Moving along, the zombies experience was generally the best it's ever been, and it got off to a bit of a rough start. New maps, new bugs, new characters, but by the time the full DLC cycle was completed, it was downright amazing. Off the top of my head, you had a ton of remakes of old maps. There was Ascension, fully fleshed out Dead Ops, Origins, Der Eisendrock, Shadows of Evil, Shangri-La, Shino Numa, Zetsubo no Shima, Moon, Kino Der Toten. Uh, finally, I believe you had Revelations near the end. Every map had a ton of Easter eggs and unique available playstyles. Oftentimes you had multi-map Easter eggs that you had to complete an Easter egg on one map and then move to another to unlock the thing to get the final ending. And the Gobblegum system, I'll admit, not very good. Very microtransaction heavy. 
very punishing to the zombies community, yet the players didn't seem to mind because the game that was built around it was still excellent. When it comes to zombies, I just loved replaying the new updated old maps with the old characters and the new characters to get the blood, to get the new endings and affect the multiverse in different ways. And in my mind, Revelations is still truly the official ending of Call of Duty Zombies. That's where I just like cut my little slice of the cake and say, this is all the story that I want. And there was so much Zombies content that it was basically a game unto itself. And as I do the commentary, I think I'm remembering that Activision actually sold Black Ops 3 Zombies Resurrection, maybe with Z's. I can't remember the title, but I think they sold Black Ops 3 Zombies just as its own game, as its own pack. And the community was super into it. And I remember the insane amount of hype for Easter egg hunting and zombies and unlocking zombies camos. And it was just a great time. Now, as great of a time as I had with Black Ops 3, not everybody did. And I would be remiss not to mention some of the game's more serious flaws here near the end of the video. Because no game, no matter how much I like it or how well received it is by the community, is without flaws. And Black Ops 3 has a couple of big ones. Let's start off with the number one biggest flaw, which was that this game was price gouging to the maximum, or at least until Black Ops 4 came out. Black Ops 3 was a full paid game with pre-order bonuses and special editions. It had microtransactions on top of that, more specifically loot boxes, which were at the time known as supply drops. And it had paid DLC access to get more maps and more zombies. And if you wanted new guns, you had to get them with the supply drops. It had everything except a battle pass, which didn't exist at the time, and Black Ops 4 would have that. And the paid DLC model for new maps was pretty normal at the time, but it was already starting to get annoying and people were pushing back on it. Where things really started getting wild is supply drops. They were fine at first, and then suddenly the only way you could get the new weapons was via supply drop. Getting the DLC or paying a fixed price or doing a challenge didn't do it. You had to get lucky and get them via drops, and drops I think averaged to about one or two dollars each. But as the game continued, there was more loot, more little gun pieces, more little armor pieces, more camos, more customizations and stickers and stuff, and it became more and more expensive to unlock the new weapons, so much so that late in the game's life cycle, it could easily cost 500, and if you're unlucky, maybe even a thousand dollars just to get the new guns. And I knew some people that would drop like two grand every time there was an update just to get everything. At a certain point, as a full-time Call of Duty YouTuber, it wasn't even financially viable for me to unlock new weapons to make in-depth episodes or reviews about them. I would lose money doing that. And Black Ops 3 didn't invent supply drops. To be fair, Advanced Warfare did, and I think it was an Activision top-down directive to have something like this. But it did farm more money from them than any other game before or after. Advanced Warfare was more fair, Infinite Warfare was more fair, and it created this community on YouTube. This was like the peak supply drop opening days, where people would just spend $1,000 and sit there for the next hour opening the drops slowly, one at a time, Viewership was stupid high on these. I don't know why, I guess people just love gambling, but they would stream these openings and just spend gobs of money and it would ultimately encourage their fans to do the same thing, even though it was an unethical model. And I just felt like the entire community was being farmed for every penny that it was worth on every level that it could be. The situation was so bad that the community rebelled and did a black market blackout or boycott, which to the best of my knowledge didn't work. And it didn't really change anything, except it did make a whole bunch of Call of Duty hate channels very popular. Some of those channels managed to ride the supply drop hate all the way into today, even. They're, they're still riding the hype of just hating on those supply drops. And that is, in my opinion, the most meaningful flaw with Black Ops 3. But there's several others that I would like to briefly mention. Second of all, the 3D movement was very hard for some people to master, and that did push some people away from the game. On console, I felt like I needed the four button scuff to play. On PC, it wasn't so bad, but on console, I felt like a two button scuff would barely get me by, but a four button scuff to have all this extra like crazy crab claw holding the controller thing going on was absolutely necessary to manage all the jumps and movements and things. And if you had a basic controller, or if you didn't want to invest the time to sort of level up your skills or play claw, which is terrible for your fingers, it was going to be hard to keep up. So there may have been an equipment difference for my level of enjoyment. I do not think the game had the greatest spawns in the world. It really, <laughs> it really did. I got to be honest. It really didn't. Uh, they could have improved those. And there were a number of 
unusual buggy interactions, most often between the score streaks with counterplay and the player abilities that were new to the franchise. Also, a lot of the zombies maps would launch uh, with bugs or timers that lock the Easter egg or some sort of problem, and the zombies experience is one that usually improved over time and was quite rougher at the game launch and often rough at the launch of the DLC itself. So all of that above is why I think Black Ops 3, minus the flaws we just talked about, is the greatest Call of Duty game ever made. It's definitely the Call of Duty game that I played the most and that I had the most fun with. I advanced levels further in this game than any other Call of Duty game over the last 20 years. I got the maximum camo, prestige to max, spent gobs of money to buy DLC weapons, which is something I really shouldn't be bragging about here. I'll probably still get hate from that. And after all the years and many sequels since, I have not played a Call of Duty game that has had a more complete package than Black Ops 3. Great campaign, great zombies, great multiplayer, great DLC cycle great almost everything about the game except it was just expensive to play but i still absolutely loved it guys that is my opinion about the best call of duty game of all time i hope that you enjoyed it i hope that you learned something useful if you did don't forget to like favorite and subscribe or if you disagree with me let me know what your favorite call of duty game is down there in the comments below drifter out